Rare were perhaps the most well-loved studio on the Nintendo 64. In fact, I personally know many people who prefer the British developers' work on the console to that of Nintendo themselves. Whilst I equally love both companies, it would be hard to argue that without Rare's contribution to the Nintendo 64 library, that the console would have even been more of a commercial flop than it was. And when you consider that four of the top 10 best-selling Nintendo 64 games were from Rare, then it's also fair to say that many of us lapped up their games back in the day. And so for today's video, let's take a look at the history of Rare's work on the console in chronological order, as we witness the growth of not only their legacy, but also the talent of the staff they had working for them at that time. As always, I'll just be giving an overview here, but if you're interested in finding out more about any of the games featured in this video, then head to the video description box where there will be links to individual reviews which I've completed for these games over the years. Killer Instinct Gold was Rare's first release on the console, but it almost didn't happen. Originally planned as a Super Nintendo sequel to the smash hit Killer Instinct, it wasn't until the announcement of the Nintendo 64 that Rare switched production to the new hardware. The sequel to Killer Instinct was being created by both teams at Rare, with one working on the arcade version to be called Killer Instinct 2, and the other using the new Ultra 64 development kit, which they had just taken delivery of to create what would become Killer Instinct Gold. Fans of the franchise will often be split as to which version they prefer, as there are some major differences between them. Focusing on the Nintendo 64 edition, which was released as Killer Instinct Gold, there are some audiovisual upgrades over the arcade version, but at the same time, the more limited roster of characters, including the removal of some fan favourites, has always divided opinion. I've always enjoyed the game despite being, well, to be fair, quite terrible at fighting games as a genre, although I personally do prefer the arcade Killer Instinct 2. Sadly, that wasn't the version they decided to use in the Rare Replay compilation for Xbox. That version has more frames of animation which I think gives the overall visual aesthetic a much smoother look to it, and of course the characters which were removed for a Killer Instinct Gold. It was a mixed start to life on the Nintendo 64 for Rare, and the development missed the launch date for which the game was originally scheduled to be part of. The average reviews it garnered on its release didn't help, and it didn't go on to become the sequel that everybody had hoped for. I was a big fan of the original, and so I agree with many people that the changes to the combo system were not for the better. Still though, the franchise as a whole always retained its fan base, which is why it annoyed so many that it wasn't until 2013 with the Xbox One release of Killer Instinct that the series lay dormant. Blast Core was what I consider to be a statement game from Rare. When pretty much any standard genre of game would have been a safer bet, Rare instead decided to take it upon themselves to give a project to four recent graduates to basically see what they could come up with based on some loose ideas of having a destructible environment and buildings. The small team size which never grew to more than seven staff members was credited for the reason that the development went so smoothly. The core concept is really simple. You need to clear a path of a runaway nuclear character which cannot be stopped and the only way for you to do that and complete the level is to basically destroy a number of buildings in its path. It may sound like a B-movie plot from the 1980s, but in Blast Core it works incredibly well. The gameplay is spread over 57 levels and you have a number of vehicles to master which all have their own abilities. After just over a year in production the game was released to almost universal praise. While some saw it as an action game, others saw it as more of an action puzzler. But no matter which way you see the game, it will be hard not to find a huge amount of fun and at times frustration when playing. It lacks some of the visual quality that later Rare games would become known for, but at its core, and no pun intended, the game is incredibly addictive. Whilst as a whole it's clear to see that it took inspiration from games like Rampage, but in a true Rare manner, they didn't copy but instead reimagined and added a touch of their own magic that they were known for. I'd personally love to see this series make a comeback, but I imagine that it would struggle to sell in big numbers in this modern era. It's a true product of its time, encapsulating that late 90s attitude and not taking itself too seriously. If you haven't played this title before then it's definitely one to own and it does remain a cheaper cart to pick up for any collectors. It often appears in top 100 Nintendo console game of all time lists and rightly so. A sequel was considered, but ultimately the studio felt that they had already fully explored the concept that the game presented, 
and they didn't feel that there was any need to go back because there was no ideas that they had to make a true advancement for any sequel. But how do you feel about this game? Let me know in the comments if you would still like to see a remake or a reboot to this title. With licensed games, and especially those from movie franchises, often being terrible games, it was fair to say that despite the track record of Rare, nobody predicted what a groundbreaking and monumental game Goldeneye would go on to be upon its release in 1997. I remember reading previews in N64 magazine, and when they first got their eyes and eventually their hands on the game, they were starting to hype the game, and it was around this time when I first began to expect that this was not going to be just another movie license game. However, as a whole though, the general media were fairly uninterested in this title, and even after the showing at E3 in Atlanta 97, in the year of the game's release, it did little to help break through into mainstream media hype. As is sometimes the case when discussing games such as this, there's very little that hasn't already been said before. With the game being pretty much universally regarded as one of the best first-person console games of all time, and, well, to be fair, there's not really much information from its concept, production and release that hasn't already been covered in minute detail in many other videos. Like many though, I'll naturally best remember the game for the many hours of multiplayer deathmatches hunched around a 27-inch CRT with friends just having carefree fun. The game has gone on to be such a historical title that even a feature-length movie from director Jim Miskell called Going for Goldeneye was made based solely around how much this game's multiplayer mode meant to people. And on a side note, that's a freaking awesome movie, and it's now available on Amazon Prime Video for those who have a subscription, so go and check it out if you haven't already done so. Despite the previous two games from Rare on Nintendo 64 being well received, it wasn't really until Goldeneye that Rare became an integral part of N64 history in my opinion. I would say that this was easily one of the biggest system sellers of the time, and a game which is now ageing, but nostalgia goggles will pretty much allow everyone to overlook those problems and gain pleasure from the game. With reviews often in the high 90s and remakes and reboots often always of high interest, it's easy to say that if you ever owned a Nintendo 64 during its lifespan, you will at some point have played and loved this game. If you are still yet to play this game, don't play any other version other than the Nintendo 64 edition, to see where it all began. This was a time when Rare really started to hit their stride, and their upcoming projects and games suddenly became the most anticipated releases on the platform. With the release of Diddy Kong Racing, we didn't have to wait long to get our next magical experience from Rare. 1997 was one of the few occasions where Rare released three titles for the console in the same calendar year, and this one landed worldwide in November, ready for the Christmas sales push. As you'll find out later, ironically the game started its life at one point as a Disney-inspired kart racer, before being changed into Pro-Am style racing. With their next title originally planned as Banjo-Kazooie, which was being delayed, Rare realised that they needed a stronger character to lead their new racing game and opted for Diddy Kong instead of Donkey Kong, a decision which Nintendo apparently enjoyed. This proved to be a great idea as a small team were able to change the assets fairly quickly and get this AAA title on store shelves as planned. Like Rare's previous work, they were commended for a lack of fog and their technical prowess with the Nintendo 64 hardware, and the fact that they took the best parts of Mario Kart and offered something unique rather than just a clone. While fans of both Mario Kart and DKR will always argue as to which the better title is, it's fair to say that both games in their own right have strengths and weaknesses which complement one another rather than offering too much direct competition. For me personally, I've always preferred Diddy Kong Racing. The huge single player adventure mode was a bigger draw for me than its multiplayer offering, of which I think that Mario Kart 64 has the edge. Whilst fans of Rare seem to always remember Mr. Norgate for his superb music work on the console, David Wise composed a soundtrack which instantly brings back some incredible memories for me and I put it as one of the best soundtracks as a whole on the Nintendo 64. Banjo-Kazooie was originally planned as Rare's fourth title on the console, but it ended up as its fifth. The story of the game's development was covered in a fantastic All Your History Are Belong To Us episode, which I'm sure many of you will already watched, and so I won't go into too much detail about it because that's not really what this video is about. What this video is about, however, is a retrospective overview of Rare titles from the era, and perhaps few could argue that Banjo-Kazooie was another stellar title from the British developer. 
creating two lovable characters, one of the best villains on the N64, and upping the ante on everything that Super Mario 64 offered, Banjo-Kazooie was a smash hit, and as their only game released in 1998, it really needed to be. In my review of the game I talked about how I mostly remember game for being one which I played in the hospital ward due to my brother's illness, the fact that I still remember the game so positively despite the sad surroundings is a testament of just how much of a feel-good factor this game can give you as a player. With non-linear levels and you're basically free to explore Gruntilda's lair, seek out the secrets, collect items and learning new moves along the way to aid you in your progression, it was all contained in a game which had stunning visuals, a great soundtrack from Grant Kirkhope, which was another masterclass in how to release an all-time classic from Rare. These days, despite having much love for the original, it's the Xbox 360 version which was also released on Rare Replay that I tend to prefer playing due to its much improved controls. One thing that hasn't changed, however, is the great relationship between the bird and bear combo. This packs in a ton of humour, and when combined with the over-the-top Gruntilda, it created a game which is as fun to play, and it is to learn about the characters as you play through the game. One thing I've always loved though, is that I expect that not many of you who played the game will realise that Gruntilda is in fact based off a famous children's TV character from the 1980s that I grew up with. Gruntilda was clearly inspired by a witch named Grotbags from a 1980s show called The Pink Windmill which I don't believe ever left the UK. But for those of us of a certain age, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about and you'll get a smile when thinking about the link. In another fun twist, she was also obsessed with getting hold of a bird from the show called Emu. So were you aware of this link or did you have no idea who Grotbags was? Let me know in the comments if you remember this character from your childhood. Having mastered a first person shooter, kart racing, platform games, and having a stab at a fighting game, and also whatever you want to throw a blast core into, Rez at next outing was a third person shooter in the form of Jet Force Gemini. As Rez first release in around 14 months, many grew skeptical that Rare would be able to continue their series of hit N64 releases for the console, especially when it was yet another new genre for the company to be creating a game for. And this was coming from the Blast Core team, who were still relatively young in their game development careers. Due to be released in mid-1999, due to coding issues and production of the cart problems, the game didn't hit store shelves until Q4, but that didn't stop Rare fans from snapping up copies of this sci-fi shooter that gave you three characters to play as, and a storyline that drew inspiration from Star Wars, Dune, Battle of the Planets and Alien as inspiration. At its heart, it's a fast-paced shooting game with some clever level design and some epic boss battles thrown in the mix but it was the need to rescue the native tribal characters which quickly began to sour players' experience with the game, and for many it left a bad taste in their mouths by the end of the game's storyline. For me, however, it was the controls which caused the most problems, and this was surprising as the rare titles before this had all been so well refined in that area. Visually though, the game looks great, and despite the studio dropping the expansion pack support during its development, and the space opera style soundtrack, it really gives the game's score some gravitas when combined with the good Dolby surround systems that were available at the time. Like Banjo-Kazooie, I find it much easier to play the game using the patched control method for modern consoles that was added to the Rare Replay version of this game, and it helps make it much more playable, not just from a modern perspective, but also from a retro game fan's perspective too. If I could personally pick one Rare game to make a realistic comeback, and that's ignoring all of the Nintendo-owned characters in some of their other games, which is never going to happen, then this would be the one that I'd likely to pick to be my choice to be rebooted or to be bought back for a HD remaster. But which N64 Rare game do you like to see come back? Let me know in the comments below. After Jet Force Gemini, the studio had for the first time in a while shown a chink in its armour. The once untouchable studio had released the game which, although received positive reviews, it had been called out for having flaws and was averaging scores of about 80% instead of scores in the 90s that they had become accustomed to. 1999 would end up with both a commercial hit and a game which also had its flaws with the release of Donkey Kong 64 in November. Donkey Kong Country as a series on the Super Nintendo showed just how technically capable Rare were and many fans, myself included, were eager to see what they would be doing with the 64-bit iteration. Now I've always personally had mixed feelings about the game. I can see why it received such high reviews, 
and due to the amount of copies it shifted, it's easy to see why so many people remember the game so fondly. On the downside for me though was the frankly insane amount of collectibles and the forced character changes required to collect items specific to each character that really turned me off. As a whole though, I never felt it lived up to the Donkey Kong Country series, which are some of my all-time favourite games. But even as a 3D platform game, I felt that Banjo-Kazooie offered a much more concise and playable experience. I would have been interested to see what they could have done with a 2D Donkey Kong Country game, but that wasn't really the direction that Rare felt like taking at that time. And to their credit, they created a 3D Donkey Kong game which appealed to fans of the character, but also they added new characters to the universe which felt unique enough to diversify the gameplay. And so I'm interested in what you'd like to have seen Rare do with Donkey Kong on the N64. Do you think they made the right decisions with this title, or do you have any other ideas about how they could have improved the experience? The year 2000 was to be a monumental and important year for Rare. With the console hardware really struggling against the CD-based power of the PlayStation and PS2 landing that year, it was really imperative that Rare continued to deliver high-quality AAA titles to fill the holes that Nintendo's first-party games left in the release schedule. So for the first time, Rare came back for a Nintendo 64 release from a same genre, the first-person shooter, a genre which they had defined on the Nintendo 64 and were now ready to up the ante once more. After turning down the opportunity to produce a Bond licensed game, many fans wondered what direction the studio would take with their next FPS. Fans of Goldeneye didn't need to worry however, because when Perfect Dark landed, it was plain to see this was a huge enhancement from Bond's earlier masterpiece. Using an upgraded Goldeneye engine, the studio had managed to start their own new IP with the introduction of Joanna Dark and the Carrington Institute. With a sci-fi plot which allowed some awesome weapons and gadgets, a plot involving evil corporations and alien life forms, it had everything that made me tick at that time. And when combined with enhanced visuals and more multiplayer modes, it instantly needed to be a day one pickup for many N64 owners. Perfect Dark in a way was ahead of its time in other ways. Putting a female character as a lead was still a daring move, but perhaps less so since Lara Croft's Tomb Raider had done so well. One thing that was a surprise though was that the game didn't seem to sell as well as Goldeneye, and I feel this was for a number of reasons. Firstly, the N64 library was more padded out with titles than when Goldeneye was released, but also, by the time of this game's release, some people had already started to leave the console and were moving on to the next generation, or they'd been bitten by FPS bug and had switched to PC gaming which had a whole plethora of games to go back and play. But hey, that's just my theory, a game theory. It was unusual for Rare to release three games in one year, and that was even stranger to release two of their games around the same time. But despite that, that's exactly what happened with Mickey Speedway USA. Many gamers often forget or don't even realize that this was made by Rare. After all, it had a quick production cycle, had very little hype, and it wasn't the kart racer which everyone wanted, which was a follow-up to Diddy Kong Racing. Despite that though, the game is actually fairly fun to play, but it's more in the vein of Mario Kart than DKR. With Diddy Kong Racing, the game had a big focus on adventure and exploration, whereas Mickey Speedway USA is much more a linear experience, and you have a series of races, a couple of characters to unlock, and the replayability really comes from doing time trials. What perhaps hurt the game the most though, was that the other Rare game released just seven days later was one which many people had been waiting for. Arriving only a week after Mickey Speedway USA, many gamers had been yearning for a follow-up to Banjo's initial adventure. Rare said that they had listened to feedback and were reducing the amount of collectibles in the game and were instead focusing on creating larger levels and a world which was seamlessly interlinked in the same style as Ocarina of Time. The game was both a commercial and a critical success, selling over 3 million copies and wowing reviewers of the time with its beautiful textures, open world feel to the game and the game not being padded out with fiddly collectibles like Donkey Kong 64. You can't please everyone though. Some noted that Rare had in fact stagnated with its innovation and that although a more in-depth game, it still felt like a throwback to Super Mario 64 from the console's launch and that the wide open worlds which lead into the different levels taking place, it could leave players confused unless they were spending vast amounts of time playing the game in each sitting. For me, however, I enjoyed the game, but I always preferred Banjo-Kazooie. It's strange because I know that technically this is the superior title, 
but it's something more straightforward and I guess nostalgic that makes me much more inclined to play the first game when considering which of the two to play. Like Banjo-Kazooie, this also received an Xbox 360 port, which is also the version on Rare Replay. With the improved controls, this would also make it the go-to version for me. From a collector's perspective, this game's always retains a relatively high price point. And so for the pocket money you can get the full Rare Replay disc, that's something to take into consideration before deciding which version you want to get hold of. By 2001, Nintendo 64 owners were dropping like flies. And if they hadn't already moved over to the PlayStation 2, then they were probably waiting for either the original Xbox or Nintendo's GameCube later in that year. That would and should have been a very difficult time to release any game, never mind another AAA title. But you could say that Rare Swan Song on the console was perhaps their most controversial and ambitious title to date. Originally designed as yet another cutesy 3D platform game, the adult change in tone and storyline was enough to enrage magazines to stop coverage of it before the game's release. Too afraid to publish this piece of smut. For me though, Conker's Bad Fur Day is a gaming reminder of what life in 2001 was like here in the UK as a young man. It was a time of greed, drinking yourself into a stupor at bars and smoking, enjoying gratuitous violence in movies and the media, and all in all just doing whatever you want to do without any care in the world as to what others thought. Whilst many would say that Blast Core was the studio's most innovative title on the N64, it's hard to deny that Conker's Bad Fur Day was just something so groundbreaking and unbelievable that it's not their most remembered game. What was even more shocking though was that Nintendo let them ride with their idea. A company known for their family-friendly and somewhat conservative attitudes took the reins off. Can you only imagine just how much fun it would have been to have been at Rare HQ when making this game? Any production meeting must have been a hilarious event with everyone throwing in crazy ideas which they had perhaps been bottling up inside for years whilst working on more mainstream games. Regardless of the controversy around the game and the media storm it led to, Conker's Bad Fur Day was the perfect farewell from Rare on N64. Their magnum opus, their last big hurrah, and their final sign off on what will always be remembered as an epic legacy. With Rare being sold to Microsoft before really getting going on the GameCube, I often felt that their acquisition by Microsoft was really a sad ending. They never seemed to recapture the form when owned by Microsoft that had led the company being sold to Microsoft such big gaming news. Some argue that Microsoft wanted them for what they had shown in their previous games, but some also argue that the acquisition was a way to severely hit Nintendo with the loss of one of their biggest studios. I personally agree with both, and see the real reasons being somewhere in the middle. But nothing can change the fact that for six years between 1996 and 2001, they were intertwined with my love of Nintendo 64 as much as Nintendo themselves. They were true pioneers, risk takers and game changers. A studio which innovated as much as they took great ideas from the past, reworked them and made new classics. Quite simply, when you think of the Nintendo 64, you'll instantly think of Rare. And so no matter what the company has now become, they always will be remembered as a real part of Nintendo 64 history. So as always, thanks for watching, and until next time.